الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله as we come to the second half of the month of Sha'ban al-Mu'azzam approaching the month of Ramadan uh, Alhamdulillah we're hosting today the spiritual dimensions of fasting as we approach the month of Ramadan because we Alhamdulillah grow up learning the rules of fasting we fast in the month of Ramadan however we um, forsake the spiritual element the spiritual dimension of the fast Today, inshallah, I'll be going through uh, Kitabu Asrar al Som of Imam Ghazali in Kitabu Ihya Ihya Ulum al Din. So, Imam Ghazali's uh, masterpiece, The Revival of the Religious Sciences, Ihya Ulum al Din, is divided into a number of chapters, number of books. Within the Ihya, he has a chapter called Kitabu Asrar al Som, the chapter of the secrets of fasting. So inshallah we'll be covering that for our uh, session today, our library event today. It all revolves around Kitab Asrar al-Sawm, the book of the secrets of fasting of Ihya Ulum al-Din. What I've done is as I've um, transferred the entire book into a presentation format. So as we progress through the, uh, the lesson, the lecture, we'll be inshallah also looking at the uh, presentation. Well it's not everything won't be on the presentation. Otherwise, you just have me reading the presentation and there's, you know, what's the point of attending? You can just take the presentation and just read it yourself. So you need to give you something with that, inshallah. So, <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, Kitabu Asrar al sawm the book of the secrets of fasting, the spiritual dimensions of fasting. The... Contents of this chapter, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi starts off with the khutbah, the sermon. After the sermon, he moves on to the fada'il, the virtues of fasting, from the verses of the Qur'an and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the chapter itself consists of three fusul, three sections. Al-Faslu al-Awwal, the first section, is regarding, these are my titles, They regard the first fasl, the first section of Kitab uh, Asrar al is regarding the fiqh of fasting. So uh, because our discussion today is on the spiritual element, the spiritual dimension of fasting, we're not going to be covering section one. Section one is all revolving around the fiqh. So you, alhamdulillah, we grow up studying fiqh. And also um, next Saturday, the 26th of March, we have a, uh, a whole um, seminar here for brothers and sisters, the fiqh of fasting. So we'll be covering that then anyway. So then we move on to section two, which is Asrar um, al-Sawm uh, wa Batina, the secrets of fasting and the internal conditions of fasting. And that will be the main uh, element of today. Section two of this chapter is the main discussion for our gathering today, inshallah. And then the final section, Fasl Thalith, is fasts outside of Ramadan. So beyond Ramadan, we also have the fasts. Imam Ghazali divides them into three categories, and inshallah, will uh, that that will lead us to the conclusion, inshallah. So the disclaimer is that uh, number one, we're not covering section one because it's on fiqh, and fiqh will have a whole another session, inshallah, on it. Uh, also, Imam Shafi, Imam Ghazali Shafi, rahimahullah taala, and most of us are Hanafi and Maliki, mashallah. So um, it would be counterproductive for us to learn it uh, as a basic fundamental rules. And the second disclaimer is that I've not put everything onto the presentation. So that's not everything that is in Ihya Ulum al Din or in the chapter, but rather some important points and some points are not in the presentation. I'll mention from the book as well, inshallah. So this is the order for our a library seminar uh, or our library event today we're going to cover the khutbah the khutbah the sermon that starts off a chapter or starts off a book uh, holds many barakat holds many blessings the sermon in itself is a request from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the remainder of the chapter or the book easy for yourself and also within the sermon the khutbah the author reveals many secrets 
he foreshadows the chapter. So when you read a certain book and you read the khutbah, the certain words, terminology, certain secrets that the author hides in the khutbah, he foreshadows the rest of the book or the rest of the chapter. So inshallah we will start off with the khutbah of Kitabu Asrar al-Sawm. <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'll read the Arabic and then uh, go over the translation of the khutbah. Alhamdulillahi alladhi a'adhama ala ibadihi al-minna lamma dafa' anhum kayda shaytani wa fanna wa radda amalahu wa khayyaba dhanna idh ja'ala sawma hisnan li awliyaihi wa junna wa fataha lahum bihi abwaab al-janna wa arrafahum anna wasila shayt- shaytan ila qulubihim الشهوات المستكنة وأن بقمعها تصبح النفس المطمئنة ظاهرة الشوكة في قسم خصمها قوية المنة والصلاة على محمد قائد الخلق وممهد السنة وعلى آله وأصحابه ذو الآراء ثاقبة والعقول المرجحنة وسلم تسليما كثيرا دي خطبة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Allah's name I begin with, the utmost kind, the ever merciful. All praise be to Allah who magnified the bestowal upon his servants by repelling from them the traps of Satan and his tricks. He rejected Satan. He rejected Satan's aim and thwarted his assumptions by making the fast a fortress for his friends and a shield. And with it, meaning with the fast, he, Allah, opened for them the gates of paradise. He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, made known to them that the means of Satan to their hearts are concealed desires and that by repressing them, meaning repressing the concealed desires, the satisfied soul becomes a piercing weapon striking against its enemy, the strongest of strikes. And salutations be upon Muhammad the leader of creation and the paver of the way and upon his noble family and companions, the possessors of firm understanding and sound intellect and an abundant of peace be upon them all. This is the khutbah. There are many uh, secrets and sometimes uh, if you if you study with traditional ulama, they'll spend weeks just on the khutbah. Not a lesson, but weeks on the khutbah, on each line. Just on alhamdulillah, they'll spend so much time. But then beyond the, uh, the grammar of the khutbah, just the secrets are hidden within the khutbah. But because you know, everything that's mentioned here will be mentioned in the chapter, we'll take barakah from the khutbah and swiftly move on. Virtues of fasting. Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala says, the fast is a quarter of faith. Asawmu rubu'ul iman. Fasting is a quarter of faith. And he deduces this via two hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Asawmu nisfu sabr, fasting is half of patience. Fasting is half of patience. And in another uh, report, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Asabru nisfu iman. Patience is half of faith. So Imam Ghazali has brought these two hadith together and said, since fasting is half of patience and patience is half of faith, therefore fasting is a quarter of faith. Fasting is a quarter of our faith. Such is the importance of fasting. And it, did, it doesn't just say fasting in the month of Ramadan. Because for us, when we think of fasting, we immediately connect it to the month of Ramadan. But fasting is much more than the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is the obligatory fast. Ramadan is the obligatory fast that we must keep. However, there is much more to fasting than just the obligatory fast of Ramadan in terms of the quality of the fast, in terms of the quantity of the fast. There are many dimensions of Psalm. Fasting is a quarter of our faith. Imam Ghazali mentions, fasting is distinguished from all other types of worship. All other types of ibadat, all other types of worship on one side and fasting is on one side. Because fasting has been ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In hadith, the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in hadith Qudsi, has mentioned that fasting is ascribed to Allah, whereas other worships do not have the same form of the ascription. 
So this hadith will explain. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كُلُّ حَسَنَةٍ بَعَشْرِ يَمْثَالِهَا إِلَى سَبْعِ مِئَةِ ضِعْفٍ إِلَّا الصِّيَامِ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ وَأَنَا أُجْزَى بِهِ Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Every deed is rewarded by ten to seven hundred times. Every good deed we perform, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us from ten to seven hundred times its reward. You keep one fast, the fast is exclusion. You do one tasbih, you will get the reward of ten to seven hundred times of doing tasbih. You do dhikr once, you get the reward from ten to seven hundred times of dhikr. So all forms of ibadat, all forms of worship, it is mentioned that you have the reward of <clears throat> ten to seven hundred times illa siyam except for fasting. <clears throat> fasting does not have this restriction. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَإِنَّهُ لِي For fasting, for indeed it is for me. Fasting is for me. وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ وَأَنَا أُجْزِي بِهِ And in one narration أُجْزَى بِهِ There are two translations for this. One translation is, and I will give its reward. Every good deed has a reward from 10 to 700 times, except for fasting. For it is for me, and I will give its reward. Meaning there is no restriction. <clears throat> Mullah Ali Qari, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, in his commentary we have over here, Mirqatul Mafatih on Mishkat, he mentions that there is another narration where this is recited as Ana ujza bihi. And the translation then would be, so from the beginning, every deed is rewarded by 10 to 700 times except fasting, for indeed it is for me and I am its reward. I am its reward. Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala mentions a verse of the Quran here. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنما يوفى الصابرون أجرهم بغير حساب The patient will be granted their reward بغير حساب without measure The patient will be granted their reward without measure Ghazali says fast, Since fasting is a half of patience the reward of fasting traverses the boundaries of accountability and measurement the reward of sabr is bighayr hisab, without accountability, without measurement. There is no measurement you can give to the reward of sabr. And since fasting is sabr, then the reward of fasting cannot be measured. Such is the virtue of psalm. Such is the virtue of siyam. That its reward is bighayr hisab without measurement. Again, I reiterate, we're not just speaking about fasting Ramadan, we're speaking about fasting. We're speaking about keeping a roza anytime. Its reward is bighayri hisab. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows its reward. Well, according to one variation, ana ujza bihi, I am its reward. Subhanallah. Here a question, you might be thinking, wait a minute, are all worships for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We pray salah, that's for Allah. We give sadaqah, that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We recite Quran, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're obedient to our parents with a niyat of taqarrub Allah. That's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on all forms of worship for Allah. Why is fasting being singled out as being for Allah? Why does Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala lay say that what distinguishes fasting from other forms of worship is that it's ascribed to Allah? Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala lay asks this very same question and he gives two answers to this. He says, fasting is to leave and abstain. Kaf and tark in Arabic. To leave and to abstain. When a person fasts, it's not something that they do. You don't bring about fasting. Fasting is an abstinence. 
or in a language of mantiq you would say in a logic fasting is not shay wujudi shay adami it's not something you bring into existence it's actually something you do not bring into existence therefore fasting is a secret Psalm siyam is a secret it is not an action that can be witnessed whereas all other forms of obedience can be witnessed you're praying salah people know you're praying salah when you're fasting no one knows you're fasting you're reciting quran people can hear you reciting quran they can see you reciting quran when you're giving sadaqa people can see you giving sadaqa and sometimes the whole masjid can also hear you gave five pounds but <laughs> when you're fasting it's a secret it's not witnessed he says fasting is only witnessed by allah it is an internal action of pure patience no one knows you're fasting unless you tell them you're fasting unless you tell them no one knows if you're doing other forms of ibadat worship people can see you if you're fasting no one knows other forms of ibadat might even result in a, a, a title you done hajj you haji sab you keeping roza you know roza sab <laughs> Asa'imi, Muhammad Atiq Asa'imi, it doesn't happen. So the fast itself is a complete secret and no one knows about it. It's just between the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was once a, a salih, a righteous person from the Bazurgan Deen, from the righteous, pious predecessors. He fasted for 40 years of his life without his family finding out. He would leave in the morning for work, his wife would prepare his lunch, he would take his lunch, go to work. He would give his lunch to the ghuraba, to the poor. And then he would return home, his lunch, his lunch box is empty, so he must have eaten it. But nobody knows, only he knows and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he's fasting. So one of the reasons why fasting is said, it has been specifically ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no one can find out about the fast. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And that's how it should be. And that's how it should be. Of course in Ramadan, we all know that we're fasting. But outside of Ramadan, when we have the voluntary and sunnah prophetic fasts, no one will know if we're fasting. And that's how it should be. The second reason Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala mentions as to why Fasting has been said to be only for Allah. Fasting is a form of subjugating and coercing the enemy of Allah. When you fast, أَنَّهُ قَهْرٌ لِعَدُوِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ You are coercing Allah's enemy. You are subjugating Allah's enemy. Allah's enemy being shaitan. Allah's enemy being shaitan. The one who fasts is coercing the shaitan and subjugating the shaitan. How? The tool of shaitan, la'in, the accursed, uh, the tools are the desires, the shahawat. The shahawat, the desires, are the tool that shaitan uses. And desires are strengthened by eating and drinking. The more you eat and drink, the stronger your desire will be. The stronger your desire is, the stronger shaitan has a control over you. So, your sins, shaitan pushes you towards sins via your desires. The stronger your desires, the stronger he can push you. But the less you eat and drink, the weaker your desires. The weaker your desires, the weaker is shaitan's influence over you. This is the reason why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna shaytan la yajri min ibn Adam majra al-dam fadayyiqu majariyahu bil yu'a Satan flows in the child of Adam in the path of the veins. In the place of the flowing of the blood is the veins. So shaytan flows in the body of the human, in the veins. فَضَيِّقُوا مَجَارِيَهُ بِالْجُوعِ Messenger of Allah said, 
to narrow his path by hunger. Narrow the path of shaitan with hunger. The hungry you are, the less influential shaitan is over you. The less control shaitan has over you, the hungrier you are. This is the secret of fasting. We don't realize, first, hunger is a form of punishment. Hunger is a form of punishment, but not for Muslims. Not what Islam teaches us. Hunger is your power. Hunger is your strength. Hunger is your power. Hunger is your strength. Imam Ghazali, elsewhere in Ihya, and in his book, Al Arba'in fi Usul al Deen, has virtues of hunger. It's a whole chapter just on the virtues of hunger. This is why, if you study the lives of the Salihin, the righteous, many of them would go days on end without food because they would be in a state of spiritual elevation. In the. It's not Ramadan. I don't know when the. Brothers and sisters will be watching this. So it's not Ramadan yet. In the Shama'il, when we study, uh, study the chapter of Babu Maja'a fi Khubzi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa idamihi, the chapter on the Khubz and the Idam, the blessed bread and the, the accompaniment or the condiment that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would eat, a number of times we see the Sahaba and the Ahlul Bayt describing the food of the Prophet ﷺ and the mode of their eating. And they would say sometimes many days would pass and we would have no food. There is a hadith where Sayyida Aisha al-Siddiqa radiallahu anha, the honorable wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the mother of believers. She says, I do not satiate my hunger except that I remember the Prophet ﷺ and then I, then I weep. And then I weep. On the onset, when you look at the hadith, it seems as if she remembers the hunger of the Prophet ﷺ. And I've heard teachers teaching this. And the way that they teach it, it's as if, Na'udhu Billah, She's feeling empathy for the Prophet ﷺ. She's feeling sorry for the Prophet ﷺ that they didn't have much food. And look at me, I'm, I'm filling my stomach. That's not the case. That is not the case. When you read the commentaries of this chapter, the commentators like Imam Bajuri, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala, Alhamdulillah, we have a whole section here in the library, a whole section dedicated to the description, biography, and praise of the Prophet ﷺ in Arabic, Urdu, and English. So we have Imam Bajuri's commentary. He says, the Prophet ﷺ eating less. The hunger, hunger is two types. Ju' hunger is two types. Ittirari or ikhtiyari. Ittirari is where you're forced to be hungry. But for us, because we only see hunger from one angle, hunger is only when you are forced. But hunger has another element which is ikhtiyari, selective hunger, to choose to be hungry. This was the hunger of the Prophet al-ju'ul ikhtiyari, selected hunger. He chose this for himself and he chose this for his companions and specifically for the Ahlul Bayt, for his family. He chose to be hungry sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, we know from hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if I wanted, I will have two mountains. I could have two mountains of gold follow me wherever I go. The Prophet ﷺ was given an option to be a prophet who is a king or a prophet who lives like a slave. The Prophet ﷺ chose to be a prophet who lives like a slave. And he ﷺ himself said, one, one day, I will be hungry and I will be patient and another day I will eat and I will be grateful. When Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha remembers the hunger of the Prophet sallallahu and weeps, she is weeping on herself because when she was with the Prophet sallallahu in a state of hunger, her ruhaniyat, her ruhaniyah, her spirituality was extremely elevated. 
But when she would satiate her hunger, her, her ruhaniyat would come low. So she would cry on herself, remembering when I was with the Prophet ﷺ, we would eat less and our spirituality was elevated. And now that our beloved has departed wasallam, whenever I fill my stomach, our spirituality decreases and I cry on myself. So ru- hunger is a key to ruhaniyat. Hunger is a key to spirituality. When you are hung- hungry, shaitan has a less of a control over you. But when you are filled, then shaitan has more of a control over you. In Talbis Iblis, in Talbis Iblis it is mentioned, Abdurrahman Jawzi, uh, rahmah, he mentions that once Sayyiduna Yahya ala Nabiina alayhi salatu was salam, who is the uncle of Sayyidina Isa, Jesus alayhi salam. Sayyidina Yahya once met Shaytan. And Shaytan was carrying, he was with a, a mule, and on the mule though he had a lot of um he had a lot of plans on the uh, on the mule. Uh, so uh, Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salam asked him, What's all this? And he said, These are my traps that I trap people in. So he asked him about the traps, and there's different narrations. He mentions I have jealousy, and jealousy I give to ulama, <laughs> I give to scholars, so they're jealous of each other. He, 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 in a, another narration, it's mentioned he had a, a pitchfork, and he said, I use this at a time of salah, when a, a believer starts salah, I poke him with a pitchfork, so he starts praying his salah quickly. I have honey. When someone backbites, I put honey into his or her mouth, so they taste they taste the sweetness of the honey, and they start to taste the sweetness, superficial sweetness of backbiting, so they accustom themselves to backbiting. Yahya Ali Salam says, "Do you have any trap for me? Have you ever trapped me in any of your traps?" The great Prophet Yahya Ali Salam, he says, "No, I've not trapped you." So Yahya Ali Salam becomes happy. Shaitan's not trapped me. He says, however, when you eat, I make sure you fill your stomach. And when you fill your stomach, when you fill your stomach, then your concentration in your worship decreases slightly. So that's what I do for you. I make you fill your stomach when you eat. When Yahya heard this, he says, I swear by Allah, I will never fill my stomach from this point onwards. From now on, I will never fill my stomach. And Iblis said, I swear by Allah, from now on, I'm never going to tell anyone anything. <laughs> so from the secrets of ruhaniyat, spirituality, is hunger. If you re- sit with the righteous, this is what they teach you. From the brothers who were uh, here in Gumgol Sharif, affiliated with the Darbar, Darbari Aliya Gumgol Sharif, the affiliation is with Huzur Zinda Peer, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And one brother told me that they won Hajj once. And there was a brother who was in the queue to go to the bathroom. And he said to the Shaykh, Hazard, I've been with you for some time. I haven't seen you go to the bathroom. The Shaykh says to him, well, you're eating, so you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Eat less, you'll have to go less. So the lesson on eating and hunger is something that the awliya teach to their murids, their spiritual disciples. We'll swiftly move on um, to the virtues. I think this is the last slide on the virtues that we'll move on, inshallah. In, in the beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam has mentioned, I swear by the one in whose power is my life, the odor from the fasting person's mouth is more pleasant in the court of Allah Almighty than the fragrance of musk. The fasting person because they've not eaten for some time, the odor emanates from their mouth. That odor, odor for the people of dunya is an odor. It smells. As a fasting person, when that odor emanates from yourself, you're reluctant to speak much. You want to rinse your mouth. You want to use a siwak or the miswak to freshen your breath. So you yourself find that distasteful. But that odor is beloved in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More, it is more pleasant than the, fragran- the fragrance of musk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the same hadith mentions, he has left his desires 
eating and drinking for my sake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding the sa'im, the fasting person, he has left eating, he has left his desires, he has left eating, he has left drinking for my sake. So the fast is for me and I am its reward. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Paradise has a door called Rayyan. Only the fasting people will enter through it. So the abwab, the gates of paradise are many. One of them is Rayyan. This gate of paradise has been designated just for the fasting people. The fasting people will enter through this door. The fasting person is promised the meeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama mentioned لِلصَّائِمِ farhatan. The fasting person has two moments of happiness. The fasting person will have farhatan, two moments of happiness. farhatun عِنْدَ iftarihi, A happiness at the time of opening his fast. A happiness at the time of iftar. That happiness we've all felt. You spent your whole day and you're thinking about one thing, iftar. That happiness we felt. There is another happiness that we've been promised that inshallah we will feel. And the happiness at the time of meeting his Lord. This glad tiding of Rabb, meeting the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is granted to the Sa'im to the fasting person. لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ باب وَبَابُ الْعِبَادَةِ الصيام. Everything has a door and the door of worship is fasting. Everything has a door and the door of uh, worship is fasting. Fasting allows you to perfect your worship. Fasting allows you to focus on your worship. That in the next slide, inshallah, we'll speak about that uh, slightly more. If I remember correctly, Ibn Kamal Pasha, rahmatullahi ta'ala, lay, in his commentary on Riyadh al-Saliheen, he discusses ibadah and fasting. Every craftsman has a workshop. So a craftsman will have a workshop and a craftsman will have a tool. Ibn Kamal says, the Abid, the one who worships Allah, Ibadah is a, a, a Sunnah, Ibadah itself is a craft. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a skill. Like any skill, you work on maintaining the skill and perfecting the skill. Worship is a skill. Therefore, worship has a workshop and a tool. The workshop of Ibadah is seclusion. The workshop of worship is seclusion and the tool is due hunger. So every craftsman will have a workshop and a tool. For us, we are the slaves of Allah. This is a skill that we need to develop. So our workshop is seclusion. And the tool we use to perfect our worship is due, is hunger. And the last hadith, the sleep of the fasting person is worship. Even the sleep of the fasting person is worship. That doesn't mean you just fast all day. <laughs> Brothers want to kill time. In fasting, you got two hours left, what to do? Just go to sleep. Go to sleep. That defeats the purpose of the fast. You're meant to feel the hunger. So if you're fasting and you, you have a nap, that nap is ibadah, inshallah. But don't <laughs> take it the wrong way and just sleep throughout Ramadan. What have you been doing? Just ibadat. <laughs> just been doing ibadat all throughout Ramadan. That's not the that's not the way to take this hadith. Okay. Before I we move on to section two, I want to mention the benefits of hunger. Now this is taken not from this specific chapter. However, this is important. I was thinking, when else will we cover this? So I thought we'll cover it now. It's the most pertinent time to cover this. Uh, in uh, other chapters in Ihya Ulum al-Din and also in Al-Arba'een 
في أصول الدين. Uh, we have the English of this translated here in our tasawwuf section of the library. Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala mentions the benefits of hunger. He says, أَنَّ لَهُ فَوَائِدْ كَثِيرًا Hunger has many benefits, but the foundation of the benefits, all the benefits come back to seven. وَلَكِنْ يَرْجِعُ أُصُولُهَا إِلَى سَبْعٍ All the benefits come back to seven benefits of hunger. Number one, cl- the hunger cleanses the heart, sharpens insight. Safa'u al-qalb wa nafadhu al-basira. It cleanses the heart and it sharpens the foresight or the, the insight. Ghazali says, Inna shiba' yurithu al-balada wa yu'mi al-qalb. Satiating the hunger brings forth stupidity and blindens the heart. It blindens the heart. This is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ أَجَاعَ بَطْنَهُ عَظُمَتْ فِكْرَتُهُ وَفَطِنَ قَلْبُهُ The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the one who keeps his stomach hungry, the one who keeps his stomach hungry, his understanding increases and his heart becomes sharper. The mind and heart, you can use this interchangeably. That the person's mind becomes clearer. The person can think clearly and the mind opens up as well. Whereas if a person fills the stomach, this um, reduces and decreases this ability. So to be able to think in this way that Imam Ghazali is saying, hunger is necessary. He says, the door, uh, the key to eternal bliss is ma'rifa, recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or understanding. But you will not attain understanding except if your heart is clean and if your insight is sharp, also clean. So that's the first benefit that he mentions of hunger. Some students, not now, but the last three, four years who've been studying GCSEs and A-levels, because Ramadan has been at the same time that they're studying the GCSEs and the A-levels, I always tell them this. They say, we're going to be hungry. We won't be able to focus. No, hunger is going to make you focus. If you're hungry, you're going to be focused. It's the opposite. If you're satiated, you won't be able to focus. Hunger will allow you to see the wider picture. Hung- hunger will be, allow you to see deeper into the meaning. There's a blessing of hunger. You might think, how? We need to experience this. This is something that you have to experience. There's no way to explain it. It's something you have to experience. Uh, how do you describe the, the taste of honey to the one who's never tasted honey? So you have to be hungry and consciously See how this is affecting your mind. Number two, softens the heart. Riqqatul qalb. One of the benefits of hunger is riqqatul qalb. It makes your heart softer. Hatta yudrika bihi al munajat. The heart becomes so soft that now the person will taste the deliciousness of speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a state of hunger, when you do dua, there is ladha, lazat. There is this deliciousness in your dua. There is a beautiful taste in your dua. وَيَتَأَثَّرُ بِالذِّكْرِ وَالْعِبَادَةِ Now this person will feel the effect of the dhikr and will feel the effect of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is hungry. When you're fasting in a month of Ramadan, you're hungry. How easy is it? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How easy it is it to walk to the masjid? How easy is it to stop uh, sinning? Why? Because you're hungry. Your heart is soft. Now you feel the sweetness of the dua. You feel the effect of dhikr. 
You feel the effect of your ibadah. Why? Because you're hungry. This is why if you read the, the likes of Risala Qushariya or Kashful Mahjub, the classical works of Tasawwuf, the awliya tell their murids, you need to be hungry. Don't eat. They stop them from eating for a long time. Why? Because in a state of hunger, their hearts are soft. And now they can feel the sweetness of their dua, of the zikr and of the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ta'ifa, the great uh, wali from the, the ancestors of Sultan al-Awliya, Sayyidina Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Imam al-Ta'ifa al-Awliya, Junaid al-Baghdadi, radiyallahu anhu, he says, يجعل أحدكم بينه وبين قلبه مخلات من الطعام ويريد أن يجد حلاوة المناجات. You have made between your heart and yourself a utensil filled with food. You you created between yourself and your heart a utensil filled with food, and then you want to taste the sweetness of du'a. You want to taste the sweetness of speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, if you want that sweetness in your conversation with Allah, if you want that sweetness in your dua, if you want that sweetness in the munajat, then you have to be hungry. You have to be hungry. He says, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala all the states of the heart, being in a state of humility, being in a state of fear, being in a state of uh, inclination, in a state of awe. All of these are keys to the gates of paradise. They are keys to the gates of paradise. However, hunger will allow you to knock on the door of paradise. Hunger will allow you to knock on the door of paradise. The third benefit of hunger lowers the self and cancels arrogance and deviance. Dhullun nafs. It allows you to, it cancels takabur, arrogance. You're hungry. What arrogance do you have? Whereas when you're filled, whereas when you're filled, you forget the bounty that you just received. Your focus is no longer on food and hunger and on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings. La tuksarun nafsu bi shay'in kaljua. Nothing breaks the self like hunger. Nothing breaks the self like hunger. I remember I was speaking to one of my teachers, Shaykh Qamar Ilyas, Hafizahullah ta'ala, and he said something to me so beautiful. He said, Your nafs, your ego, your nafs is like a child. So when you want your child to do something, at first you will entice your child. Do this, I'll give you a cookie. Do this, I'll give you something. But if after that your child doesn't listen to you, despite saying you're going to give X, Y and Z, then you take the other approach. I'm not going to give this to you. If you don't do this, no PlayStation for the whole week. If you don't do this, you're not going out with your friends. So your nafs is like that. So first you say to your nafs, if you allow me to pray Salatu Taraweeh, I'm going to give you ice cream. And then if your nafs is not allowing you to do this ibadah, then you say, okay, you like ice cream. I'm not letting you touch ice cream for the whole week if you don't allow me to pray Salatu Taraweeh. Jua, hunger, there's nothing which controls the nafs like hunger. This is why the Prophet ﷺ chose hunger. His hunger was selective. He chose hunger. أَجُوعُ يَوْمًا وَأَشْبَعُ يَوْمًا فَإِذَا جُعْتُ صَبَرْتُ وَتَدَرَّعْتُ I will be hungry one day and I will be satiated one day. And when I am hungry, I sabartu, I will be patient. وَتَدَرَّعْتُ And I will be humble in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa idha shabi'tu shakartu and when I am satiated I will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number four tribulation is from the doors of paradise <coughs> tribulation is from the doors of paradise the fasting person who is now hungry 
the fasting person who is now hungry, hunger is a type of tribulation. Hunger is a type of tribulation. And when the fasting person feels this hunger, this allows them and this in fact manifests, uh, magnifies their fear in the Akhirah. They feel uh, this quote-unquote punishment and tribulation of hunger. Now they can reflect on the hereafter. So they've experienced this tribulation. Whereas a person who never experiences tribulation, why will they ever reflect on the hereafter? If you hear stories of people who have accepted Islam, there's always a sense of tribulation that they've gone through which allowed them to question. Likewise, a fasting person is experiencing a tribulation which allows a fasting person to really reflect over the hereafter and not just reflect but believe and to a degree experience the tribulation. <clears throat> Number five, <coughs> mitigates all other desires which are the sources of sin. <coughs> Hunger mitigates desires and the desires are the sources of the sin. <coughs> Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha said, أول بدعة حدثت بعد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الشبع the first people talk about bid'ah all the time. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, the first innovation that the people brought about after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was to satiate their hunger, to fill their stomachs. This was the first bid'ah. In al qawma lamma shabi'at butunuhum, jamahat bihim nufusuhum ila dunya. She says, certainly the nation which fills their stomach, their nufus, their egos or their, their nafs becomes defiant against them for the dunya. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Number six. Hunger prepares the body for tahajjud and worship. Khiffatul badan li tahajjud wal ibadah prepares meaning lightens the body for tahajjud and worship. Eating less allows you to sleep less. But the more you eat, the more you will sleep. The more you eat, the more you will sleep. Not only the more you will sleep, the harder it will be to wake up. Both things. Sleep and food are connected. Sleep and food have a connection. That's why the Salihin, they would eat less and they would sleep less. You can't do one without the other. You can't eat more and expect to sleep less. You can't eat more and think, I'm going to sleep less. I'm eating more, I will wake up. People complain about waking up for Fajr. Going to sleep on time is one thing, but also your food is extremely important. If you've just had a whole meal two hours before going to sleep, and it takes up to five hours to digest food, you, you're sleeping whilst your stomach is still full, and it'll be very difficult for you to wake up. So hunger, the less you eat, the less you will sleep, and the easier it will be for you to wake up. Hunger allows you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Look, I'll give you an example. In the month of Ramadan, the last prayer you pray before iftar is Asr. How spiritual is Asr? So spiritual, so focused, so attentive. Maybe you've never read your Sunnah Ghair Mu'akkada throughout the year, but you're reading it now. So spiritual. As soon as iftar hits, your stomach is full. And the hardest prayer of the day is Fajr, uh, Maghrib. Maghrib is the hardest prayer to pray. Why? Because you just feel... Look at that. Look at the contrast between the two prayers. What's the difference? Food. Food is a difference. And it's hard 
to control your appetite at that time. And we forget the, the ruhaniyat, the spirituality we experience in worship. So you eat less, it makes your body light and it allows you to wake up for tahajjud and other forms of worship become very easy. And finally, number seven, prepare the self to be satisfied with less provisions. Allows a person to be satisfied with less provisions. You're hungry, this will allow you to be satisfied with less. Look at the time of iftar. Uh, this is all what we've experienced. And I believe all of us have experienced this. At the time of iftar, you spend your whole day hungry and you're looking at all that food. You're thinking, I'm going to finish all of this. Put everything on the plate. Well, not one samosa, two samosas. Shish kebab, chawal, rice, everything. My plate's full. You're thinking, still not enough. <laughs> Time of iftar, you do your dua, have one date, glass of water, have half a samosa. That's it, I'm done. <laughs> done. Allows you to realize there's a difference between eating because you're hungry and eating because of the desire. We're unable to distinguish this. We are unable to distinguish why we're eating. Are we eating because we're hungry or are we eating because we desire to eat? The fast allows us to make this distinction. And when we understand this distinction, it allows us to, number seven, prepare the self to be satisfied with less provisions. Someone once came to Ibrahim bin Adham rahimahullah ta'ala and complained to him about a product in the market and said to him, innahu ghalin, it's really expensive. Before I tell you what he said, I'll tell you something else. There's a friend of mine, he said to him when he was younger, he'd go to the shops and you see something really nice. He'd come back to his father and tell his father about it. So he says, I once saw some really nice trainers. So he went home. And he said to his dad, Me trainer the key. And his dad said, Taknaro. <laughs> he said to his dad, I've seen some trainers. And his dad said, Carry on looking. <laughs> so, so someone came to Ibrahim bin Adham and said, It's too expensive. Complained about product. Ibrahim bin Adham said, Well, make it cheap then. You yourself make it cheap. He said, How? He said, well, Don't buy it. <laughs> If it's too expensive, don't buy it. <laughs> make it. Make it cheap. So when you're fasting, this allows you to understand how little you actually need. How little you actually need. Alhamdulillah. That was the uh, fawaid, uh, the fawaid of ju, the benefits of hunger. We we'll move straight into, we've come into the second hour now of the, the, the event. So we we'll move straight into chapter two, as I mentioned, section two, as I mentioned, Section 1 is revolves around fiqh, therefore we will not cover uh, al-faslu al-awwal, we move straight on to al-faslu thani Section 2 Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala says There are three levels of fasting There are three levels of fasting In Ihya Ulum al din Imam Ghazali presents three levels in terms of the quality of the fast and in Al-Arba'een, he presents the three levels in terms of quantity. So at the end of the slide, I'll come back to Arba'een of Ghazali. So these are the three levels of fasting in terms of the quality of the fast. Number one is called Sawmul Umum. Number two is called Sawmul Khusus. Number three is called Sawmul Khusus Al Khusus. So number one, Sawmul Umum. The fast of the public. What is this fast? Preventing the stomach and the private organs from fulfilling the desires. This is Somul Umum. So from, from uh, the morning till the evening, to prevent the stomach and the private organs from fulfilling the desires, if you've achieved that, you've achieved Somul Umum. That's what you've done. You've not eaten, you've not drank, you've not fulfilled your sexual desires, you've uh, achieved Sawmul Umum, the fast of the public. Level two, Sawmul Khusus, the fast of the righteous. 
preventing the ears, the eyes, the tongue, the hands, the feet, and all the other limbs from sins. This is Somul Khusus. So of course, in addition to the first. So this person, the one who's fasting Somul Khusus, the fast of the righteous, is not just preventing the stomach and the private organs from fulfilling the desires, but is also preventing the ears, the eyes, the tongue, the hands, the feet, and all the limbs from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This fast is known as Sawmul Khusus. The third, Sawmul Khusus al Khusus. This is the fast of the elite. Khusus al Khusus. The, not just the awliya, this is not the fast of the awliya. This is the fast of the greatest of the awliya. <coughs> this is the fast of the greatest of the awliya. This is to prevent the heart from inferior aspirations and worldly thoughts, to prevent it from everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart does not think about anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can ask you to. Yeah, Jazakallah. That way. That's it, Jazakallah. How is this fast broken? SubhanAllah. Imam Ghazali says this fast. <coughs> is broken by thinking about other than Allah. When the person thinks about other than Allah, their fast is broken. <clears throat> or thinking about other than Akhirah. And also by thinking about the world, except when thinking of the world is to acquire the hereafter. This is the station of the Prophets and the elite of the righteous. This is the maqam of the Prophets And not just the awliya, but the greatest of awliya. Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says, you can't acquire this. Level three is not something you work for. You work for level two. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you to level three. You aspire to move from Sawmul Umum to Sawmul Khusus, that's all. And you persevere in your Sawmul Khusus, persevere in the fast of the righteous. For years, for years, this is your fast, Sawmul Khusus. And if Allah wills, a time will come where He subhanahu wa ta'ala will place you into Khusus al Khusus. You can't, you can't do that. You can't sit and say, I'm not going to think of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's beyond your control. What you do is level two. Sawmul khusus. In the month of Ramadan, when you're fasting, this is your intention. I'm fasting the fast of the righteous. When you're fasting your voluntary fasts on Monday and Thursday, this is your intention. I'm not just avoiding eating and drinking. I'm preventing my limbs from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ghazali now is going to speak about Sawmul Khusus and how to achieve it. And that's inshallah our intention. So Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala now moves on to Sawmul Khusus and how we can achieve Sawmul Khusus. He says, Preventing the limbs from sins is achieved by six things. Controlling the eyes, controlling the tongue, controlling the ears, preventing the remaining limbs, not filling the stomach at the time of iftar, after the iftar, for the heart to be between hope and fear. Seven things that we inshallah make intention of doing as Ramadan approaches, make intention that this is how my fast will be. And inshallah maintain this. Controlling the eyes, the tongue, the ears. Preventing the remaining limbs. 
a thought crossed my mind why didn't he just put point one to four all into one just prevent the limbs Imam Ghazali is a teacher he's a murabbi he's one who nurtures he's giving you the easiest control your eyes okay done now move on to the tongue now move on to the ears is levels he's giving you a, a technique of how to achieve this the eyes are the easiest to consciously control then it's the tongue then it's the ears what you hear is beyond your control but whether you choose to hear it is within your control so it's harder to control the ears than it is the eyes and the tongue so he's giving you this order so that you can work on this order first focus on your eyes then the tongue the ears etc that's why otherwise the first four can all be placed into one but he's not just giving you information he's giving you a technique inshallah this is the beauty of imam ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. when you study the works of the ulama um, usually you'll see that the ulama are competing with one another to show their knowledge if you look at imam jurjani imam taftazani rahimahumallah the contemporaries and they are utilizing all of their ilm within the khutbah they want to show you the quality of ilm of knowledge that they're presenting imam ghazali is very different imam ghazali is there are three types of first <laughs> One, two, and three. Three you can't achieve, two you can, so let's go for two. It's a very different style, it's a very beautiful style. Rahimahullah uh, ta'ala. He spent years of his life in the highest seat of knowledge and left that seat of knowledge so that he could, and then he produced this work. So there's six things that we need to do. So Imam Ghazali speaks of each of them. So number one, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala says lowering the eyes and preventing extensive gazing towards anything that is reprimanded or disliked and towards anything that will occupy the heart and distract it from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one lowering the gaze so when you're fasting you're also fasting with the eyes so you now consciously lower your gaze you want to get into the habit of lowering your gaze so the fast time keeping is not somul umum, it's somul khusus. So I will lower my case. Very simple steps to follow, not easy, simple step to follow, to lower the gaze. To prevent the gaze from looking towards anything that will distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there are two things here. On a very basic level, reflect over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not let anything distract you but as you progress in your knowledge and ma'rifah everything revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so then the gaze will be whatever you look at reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but that's a level past this beyond this the starting level is to control your gaze and to not look around to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not look around and eventually, as you progress in your spiritual journey, your state may change. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, النَّظْرَةُ سَهْمٌ مَسْمُومٌ مِنْ سِهَامِ إِبْلِيسِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا خَوْفًا مِنَ اللَّهِ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِيمَانًا يَجِدُ حَلَاوَتَهُ فِي قَلْبِهِ the gaze is a poison arrow from the arrows of Satan. The gaze is a poisoned arrow from the arrows of Satan. What does that mean? It's poisoned. An arrow causes damage, but it can be removed. But a poison, once it enters your body, is very difficult to take out. So the nazar, the gaze, if it falls onto something, then it's very difficult for you to then control your gaze. It's very difficult to manage the effect of that gaze on your heart. So what to do is to control the gaze from the start. 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who leaves it, meaning haram gazing, the one who abstains from looking at haram out of fear of Allah, Allah will grant him such iman, the sweetness of which he will feel in his heart. If a person controls the eyes, they will feel halawatul iman, the sweetness of iman. In their worship, in their dua, they will feel the sweetness. But if they do not control their gaze, then how can they expect to feel this? Once a spiritual disciple came to the Shaykh and said to the Shaykh that the halawatul iman is complaining, I cannot feel the sweetness of iman. Shaykh said to him, control your eyes. Control your eyes, you'll feel it. The Prophet said, we don't need anything else, that's all. So he came back a short while and he said, I can't control my eyes. Very difficult. I have to walk through the market. That's what brothers say. Walking through city center, how do you control your eyes? You're driving, how do you control your eyes? So the Shaykh called him and the Shaykh gave him a glass. Fill the glass to the top. Fill the glass to the top and gave it to the murid, the disciple, and said to the disciple, hold this. Can I go to the market and buy X for me? Go buy me some bananas and come back. But this water should not drop. The water in this glass should not drop. So the murid took the glass into the market. He's looking around, looking at the path, but he's looking now back at the glass. He's walking, walking, walking. He eventually arrives at the, the grocer's. Buys a banana, but his focus is on his glass. And he comes back. Peer sab marsan. You know, my sheikh is, is not going to be happy. So he's got the bananas in one hand, he's got the glass in one hand. He comes back to the sheikh. He says, sheikh, the glass is full. Now a single drop has fallen out. The sheikh said, you know, this glass... This is your heart. You know, the water in the glass, that's your iman. That's your iman. If you did not focus on the water and the glass in the market, then you would have returned with the water, would have spilled out. So when you go into the market and you don't focus on your heart, you don't focus on your iman, and you look around just the way the water would have fallen out of the glass, your Iman would leave your heart. So since you focused on, focused on the glass and the water, it didn't. Likewise, you need to focus on your heart and your Iman. It's more important than the glass and the water. So it's, it can be done. It can be done. Whether we choose to do it or not is up to us. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Five things break the fast. Speaking about Somul Khusus, the fast of the righteous. And we're not speaking about the legal fast. The legal fast is broken by eating and drinking. We're speaking about the spiritual fast. The spiritual fast is broken by lying, backbiting, spreading rumors, false testimonies, and gazing with lust. Gazing with lust. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to control our eyes. Controlling the tongue. Protecting the tongue from foul speech, lying, backbiting, spreading rumors, indecent speech, harshness, quarreling and disputing. So this is something that we can consciously do. So when you enter the, the fast and you made your niyat, your intention of the fast, you know in the morning when you make your intention at the time of suhoor, you make that intention, add all these points in. I also make intention of controlling my eyes, controlling my tongue. Make a, a firm intention at the start of your day. Occupying the tongue with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reciting the Quran, this is the fast of the tongue. So leave all other speech, dhikr and Quran and manage the rest of your speech. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, <coughs> fasting is a shield. Fasting is a shield. So when one of you is fasting, he should not quarrel and argue. 
Fasting should be a shield against quarreling and argumentation. If someone argues with you or insults you, then you should say, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that if you're if you're fasting and somebody starts an argument with you, your reply should be, I'm fasting. Meaning I'm not going to get into an argument, I'm fasting. What our people do is, don't get me angry, I'm fasting. <laughs> I'm already angry. Already got short temper. Na'uzu <laughs> billah. Don't make me angry. I got roza. <laughs> don't make me angry. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, tell the person you're fasting so that both of you honor the fast and don't get into argumentation. Whereas we use a fast. The Prophet ﷺ said the fast is a shield. We use a fast as a weapon. It's a shield. It stops you from argumentation. A few years ago in Birmingham, I think 2018 maybe, in the first 10 days of Ramadan, there were so many fights and murders, if you do you remember, so many murders within the first 10 days within the Muslim community. And you think, what's going on? In Talbis Iblis, Abdul Rahman Jawzi says, there's a time where shaitan moves away from a people and says, shaitan says, there was a time where I used to teach them. Now they're teaching me. Even in Ramadan, na'uzu billah. So number two is to control the tongue. Number three, control the ears. Preventing the ears from listening to any any disliked matter. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram to say, He subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram to listen to. What is haram to say is also haram to listen to. Backbiting is haram to, to utter. But it's also haram to listen to. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the backbiter and the one who listens are equal in the sin. So we do have control over whether we choose to hear something or not. If somebody backbites, we can say to them politely, you know, I'm fasting. I can't listen to this. You can say this. Why can't we? Some people can't even acknowledge these sins. But for us who are aspirants of Sawmul Khusus, we need to control our ears. We need to control what enters our ears. What's going to enter my ears? The Quran, the hadith of the Prophet, Nasheed, Naat, Zikr, Azkar. Awrad, conversation with my spouse, conversation with your spouse, a loving conversation with the spouse itself is a reward. Conversation with my parents, with my siblings, it's all reward with good intentions. So controlling the ears is also extremely important. Number four, preventing the remaining limbs such as the hands and the feet. So stopping the hands from disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stopping the feet from disobedience of Allah. Hands of course to, to steal, to strike. Feet are to go to places which are impermissible. So prevent the feet from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stop them from going to places that you should not be in. And utilize them to go to places you should be in. Also the stomach, Imam Ghazali emphasizes the stomach here. Preventing the stomach from ambiguous foods at the time of iftar. That as well. He says, what is the benefit of abstaining from halal foods, meaning fasting, abstaining from halal foods, whilst breaking the fast with haram or ambiguous foods? You spend your entire day abstaining from halal. In the time of iftar, you're having, having ambiguous food. Ambiguous food is food that you don't know whether it's halal, but you don't know whether it's haram. That, that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse. If you don't know if it's haram, that you should leave it. That's what it means. If you don't know if it's halal, you should leave it. That's what it means. 
he says the example of this person who fasts throughout the day but then eats haram food or eats food which is ambiguous. Remember haram food is not just food like the swine, the pig, but it's also food which is bought with money which is haram. That's also that will have a spiritual impact on the person and their children. The example of this person is li like the one who builds a palace and destroys the city. And destroys the city. He continues to say, the one who abstains from taking a lot of medication out of fear of the side effects. I'm not taking a lot of medication uh, because a lot of side effects. But what he does, he takes poison. Imam Ghazali says, isn't this a stupid person? Safihan, isn't this a foolish person? He's avoided medicine out of fear of the side effects, was taken poison. He says, haram food is the poison. And halal food is the medicine which a little benefits and a lot harms. So at the your stomach, we need to also be aware of the food that enters our stomach. Imam Nawawi in his Arba'een, he mentions the hadith of halal and pure food, halal and tayyiban, halal and pure food. There is a whole discussion on the types of food as Muslims we should be eating. We shouldn't just be looking at E471 haram, let's put it down. That's, uh, back in the days, E471. I'm not sure about now. But everybody we used to open the pack and look. E471 is haram, let's give it to the neighbors. <laughs> But it's not just the, the food itself, but it's how is that food purchased. It's also about <coughs> the many elements when it comes to food. And that's a discussion for, yeah, it's a pertinent discussion to have now, but we've got quite a bit to cover. But inshallah, uh, in the future when we do Arba'een, there's a whole discussion just on the food and the effects of food. Number five, the fifth way we can achieve Sawmul Khusus, not filling the stomach at the time of iftar. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, There is not a utensil more despised in the court of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala than a stomach filled with halal. Than a stomach filled with halal. We've mentioned the points regarding this. How this makes it so difficult to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How this makes it easy for shaitan and how influential shaitan becomes over, becomes on a person by filling the stomach. So at the time of iftar, you've struggled the entire day. Just struggle a bit more. You've struggled for 17, 18, 19 hours. You've struggled so much. It's time of iftar. To struggle a bit more. Control how much you eat. How can the fast achieve the benefit of number one, subjugating the enemy, and number two, breaking the desires, when that which has been avoided the entire day now catches up to the fasting person? Imam Ghazali says, the purpose of the fast, or the hikmat, the wisdom of the fast, is to control your desires, to subjugate the shaitan, the enemy, You've been doing that the whole day and now you just do qaza of the whole day in one meal. How are you going to achieve that? How are you going to achieve that? The secret of fasting is in the weakening of strength. should be weakening. The secret of fasting is the weakening of strength. A strength is the tool of a shaitan which is uses to direct towards evil. The weakening of your strength is a secret of the fast. So what we do at the time of iftar, we just do qada for the whole day. I didn't have breakfast, I didn't have lunch, I didn't have the snacks in between. So everything is going to come into one now. Therefore, one is to eat what he would have eaten that night. Not to gather the food of the day and night into one meal. This is Imam Ghazali saying this. What you would have for supper, dinner, just have that. Don't gather everything into one. 
That's the purpose of the fast. So it is Ramadan, so you're going to have, no, mashallah, a lot of food. But in our families, we need to uh, control this. We need to control this. At the very least for ourselves. Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, rahmatullahi ta'ala, say, would say, your zuhud is your zuhud, not your families. When you enter a state of abstinence, that's for you. Don't extend this to your family. Their states of abstinence will come at the, the right time. If you want to become a person of zuhud, abstinence, you want to abstain from delicious foods, do it for yourself. Don't go home now and say, you know, for Ramadan, we're not doing any shopping. <laughs> no more samosa kebabs, no more biryani. And everyone having dal roti. <laughs> no, no. <coughs> do it for yourself. Just do it for yourself. Let them carry on as they're doing. Do shukr, they're doing somul umum. Alhamdulillah, they're doing somul umum. And inshallah, they're going to come to somul khusus. If you want to do this, do it for yourself. But this is, I think we let ourselves down at the time of iftar. We go overboard at the time of iftar. Really, uh, I think this is where we, if we can do this, Alhamdulillah, we're going to maintain a ruhaniya, a spirituality. At the time of iftar, if we can control ourselves, have the food, but just for your hunger, not for your desire. Your, your maghrib will be a spiritual maghrib. Your taraweeh and isha will be a spiritual taraweeh. And if time permits, you'll even be able to wake up for tahajjud. And the last point, after the iftar, for the heart to be between hope and fear. What does this mean? Ghazali says that the one who's been fasting throughout the day, he, he, his heart should be, now that my fast is complete, I don't know whether it's been accepted or rejected. It should be between hope and fear. You should be hopeful that it's been accepted, accepted, but you should be fearful. What if it's not accepted? We, this doesn't even cross the mind. We have iftar and alhamdulillah, I've done my job. Done. Why wouldn't it be accepted? <laughs> Astaghfirullah. <laughs> He's saying, Imam Ghazali is saying, once you complete it, just the way we finish our fast, Ghazali says, this is the state of, after every ibadah. After every ibadah, this should be your state between hope and fear. That's why when we finish salah, what do we say? Allahumma rabbana taqabbal minna. Of minni. Oh Allah, accept this salah from me. You've done the salah, you've prayed it, but you don't know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted it or rejected it. That's with every ibadah. And likewise, after iftar, then you do your dua and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the fast. Sayyiduna Hassan al-Basri, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, uh, on the day of Eid al-Fitr, he saw some people laughing. Sayyiduna Hassan al-Basri, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, the great Tabi'i. So he went and approached the people and he said to them, Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made their month of Ramadan an arena for his creation, within which they will compete for his obedience. Ramadan is an arena. You have a start and you have an end. You are competing in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan. Some have gone ahead and succeeded, whilst others have fallen behind and failed. I am amazed at the laughing competitor in the day that fast competitors have succeeded and the losers have failed. So he's saying at the end of the game, at the end of the uh, competition, I'm surprised that there are people standing there laughing. He says, I swear by Allah, had the veils been lifted, the good doer will be occupied by his goodness and the evil doer by his evil. What that means is at the end of the month of Ramadan, those who've done good, will be in awe of the bounty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted them. They'll be in a state of shukr. Oh Allah, thank you for allowing me to do so much ibadah. And those who've fallen short will be overwhelmed by their shortcoming and doing istighfar. So at the end of a competition, the winners, 
Hassan al-Basri is saying, the winners should be thanking Allah and the losers should be asking for forgiveness. There shouldn't be anyone who's laughing. What are you laughing about? If you failed, you should be doing istighfar. If you've succeeded, you should be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a high level of taqwa. Imam Hassan al-Basri is saying, there's a very high level of taqwa. What he's saying is the point that Ghazali is mentioning. That at the end of the ibadah, you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ghazali asks a question after mentioning the conditions of Sawmul Khusus. He asks a question. Have I achieved anything other than hunger and thirst? After fasting, what have I achieved? 29, 30 days, what have I achieved? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, How many fasting people do not acquire from their fasts except hunger and thirst? How many people are there that fast, but the only thing they achieve is hunger and thirst? There's much more that you're meant to achieve. You're meant to have elevated in your ruhaniyat. You're meant to have adopted a form of worship and then maintain that worship. Imam Ghazali in Mukashafatul Qulub mentions one of the signs that your Ramadan has been accepted and the ibadat, your du'as, your supplications, your worship has been accepted in Ramadan is that once the month of Ramadan ends, your good deeds continue. You've been reading Quran throughout Ramadan. Ramadan ends, you're continuing your Quran. You've been waking up for suhoor for 30 days. You woke up before Fajr even started for 30 days in a row. Are you telling me on the 31st day you can't wake up a bit later for Fajr? For 30 days you're praying 20 rakat taraweeh in addition to your Salatul Isha. Are you telling me on the 31st day you can't actually pray your Salatul Isha? So what have I, he, Ghazali says, if your ibadat, your worship, your Quran recitation, your spirituality, of course, because a month has departed, there will be a decrease in your spirituality, but your worship needs to be maintained. If you maintain your worship, then Bushra lakum. Glad tidings to you, your Ramadan has been accepted. But if as soon as your last fast ends and the Ilan the announcement is done, tomorrow is Eid, and then that's it you've somehow just turned everything upside down. And the next day it seems as if you've never spent a single day in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a good sign. So have, what have you achieved after Ramadan? What have you achieved via your fast? When Ram Before Ramadan starts, we need to make intentions. What do I want to achieve by the end of Ramadan? I've been, for example, somebody will say, I've been trying to do one khatam of Quran every month. I'm struggling. So my target this Ramadan is I'm going to do one khatam in Ramadan. And as Ramadan ends, every month I'll do one khatam. That's not a difficult target for somebody who knows how to read Quran. <coughs> Someone's been trying to pray tahajjud. They find it difficult. For 30 days they're waking up for suhoor. Train your body for tahajjud so that as the month of Ramadan leaves, you're trained to wake up for tahajjud. <coughs> Someone has a problem controlling their anger. This Ramadan I'm going to develop this, you know, this power to control my anger. So that once Ramadan leaves, I have control over my anger. Another person has a habit of backbiting. This Ramadan I'm going to work so that for 30 days I'm not going to backbite. Then of course on the 31st day I'm, I would have developed the power to control my tongue. So the question before Ramadan starts, what do I want to achieve by the end? And then every day do muhasaba, take account of yourself. And when Ramadan ends and ask yourself what have I achieved? Zakallah. 
Sorry to trouble you. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <coughs> that was section two, and that was the main section of the uh, Kitabu Asrar al Som. Alhamdulillah. We're going to. Um, the section three is quite small. In fact, I think there's only one point in section three. So we'll move on to that now. And that's fast outside of Ramadan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> Imam Ghazali says, Fasts are either yearly, monthly, or weekly. So they are voluntary fasts, or fasts of virtue, which come in the year, or they come every month, or they come every week. The yearly fasts, there's not all the fasts that Ghazali, men um, Ghazali mentions, you can check the Ihya for that. The day of Arafah, the day of Ashura, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, first 10 days of Muharram, the month of Sha'ban, the month of Rajab. These are um, yearly uh, days or weeks or months that come that hold virtue yearly. We know in hadith that Sha'ban, after Ramadan, the month where the Prophet would fast the most is Sha'ban. The most. Imam Ghazali near the end of the chapter mentions, because Ramadan, Sha'ban is connected to Ramadan, he says that it's not a good practice to continuously fast in Sha'ban leading to Ramadan. You should have a break. You should have a break just before Ramadan so that you've not accustomed yourself to the hunger. Some people think I'm going to accustom myself to the hunger so Ramadan starts, I won't feel it. You're meant to feel it. <laughs> In fact, have some real good meals before Ramadan starts. Make yourself, you know, make yourself feel that hunger. So these are the yearly fasts that come around that have some virtue. Then the monthly fasts Ghazali mentions the start of the month the middle of the month and the end of the month are virtuous days the lunar month the Islamic calendar the lunar month the start of and the middle and the end the virtuous days but specifically what are known as Ayamul Bid Ayamul Bid the white days 13th 14th and 15th of every month are known as the White days, the white days, ayamul bid. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that a person should fast on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of every month. And the one who does this, if I remember correctly, the hadith mentions the one who does this will have the reward of fasting forever. So muddahar, the one who fasts in Ramadan and then 13th, 14th, and 15th of every other month will have the the reward of just having a continuous fast, Sawm dahar Which leads me to a point, Sawm dahar which is a continuous fast every single day, is not permissible in the Hanafi school. I'm not sure in the Maliki school. Hanafi, same. It's impermissible to continuously fast every single day. We're going to cover which type of fast the Prophet ﷺ said should be the most. Insha'Allah, 13th, 14th and 15th. In Sha'ban, Alhamdulillah, we started something here in Gumgol Sharif that as soon as a month starts, we'll uh, announce the 13th, 14th and 15th and which days it coincides with. So all the community is aware of the Ayamul Bid, the white days if they choose to fast. So of course, we've done it for Sha'ban. In Ramadan, you have to fast and then we'll continue every month thereafter, Insha'Allah. And weekly, the Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays, these are virtuous days. Mondays and Thursdays and Fridays have all been mentioned in hadith. We are aware of Mondays and Thursdays because it's very common in our community. The Monday and Thursday fast. The Friday fast is also masnoon, mandub. However, in the Hanafi school, you can only fast, a voluntary fast on a Friday, when you join to it a Thursday or a Saturday. In the Hanafi school, you can't designate a Friday when it's a non-Sunnah fast 
I mean, you can't just designate a Friday and fast on a Friday. You have to add a Thursday to it or a Saturday to it. Because Friday is Yomul Eid. Friday is a day of Eid, a day of celebration. So the ulama mentioned this. And the last point on this slide before we move to the final slide. Imam Ghazali mentions something just beautiful, mashallah. And this is the last point actually of the, uh, the kitab. He says, Rahimahullahu ta'ala, that a person should not have four consecutive days without fasting. A person should not have four consecutive days uh, without fasting. Why? Because this will uh, strengthen the shahawat, it will strengthen the desires, and this is what will make ibadah difficult. How do you avoid this? By the fast of the Monday and Thursday. Fast on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you have two days where you're not fasting. Fast on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days where you're not fasting. So uh, he said a person for the self and to grow spiritually should not, not be fasting for four consecutive days. And the way to implement that is to fast the Sunnah Monday and Thursday. And we move on to the very last slide. <coughs> this is not mentioned in the kitab, but it's mentioned uh, in the Arba'een of Imam Ghazali. Rahmatullahi ta'ala the three levels of fasting in terms of the quantity. So you've mentioned the quality. Sawm al-umum, sawm al-khusus, sawm khusus al-khusus. Now in terms of the number of fasts that you can keep. Number one, the lowest in terms of the number are to just fast in the month of Ramadan. No Muslim should be fasting less than that, of course. So the lowest in terms of the, the quantity of your fast are to suffice with the month of Ramadan. No Muslim should be fasting less than that. The highest and the most, you might think the most is fasting every single day. But the Prophet ﷺ forbade this. So a Sahabi, a companion, came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said that I've made intention that I will fast for the rest of my life every single day. The Prophet ﷺ told him off, reprimanded him, told him not to do this and said, I fast and don't fast. ﷺ. So the, uh, if a person wants to fast, the highest in terms of quantity is known as Sawmu Dawood. The fast of Dawood alayhi salam. The fast of Dawood alayhi salam is to fast one day and to miss one day. Hazrat Dawood ala nabiyyina alayhi salatu wa salam would fast one day, miss the next day, fast the next day. That's, the, that's called Sawmu Dawood and that's the maximum that a person fasts outside of Ramadan. The middle is to fast a third of the year. Now when I read this, Imam Ghazali again is amazing. He's saying a fast a third of the year, that's the middle. Now I'm thinking, how do you fast a third of the year? A third of the year, that's four months. So he's saying fast four months. How on earth are you going to do that? Which is absolutely amazing. Hujjatul Islam, Imam Ghazali. This is how you fast a third of the year. Fasting in the month of Ramadan. Now, if you take the Gregorian calendar as an example, you have 52 weeks in the year. Ramadan is about four weeks. So remove those four weeks. 52 minus four is 48. That's 48 weeks that is not Ramadan. Now if every week you fast on a Monday and a Thursday, that's two days. Every week you're fasting two days. 48 times two is 96. 96. 96. I've calculated it before. That's why I'm confident. 96. 96 plus the 30 of Ramadan, 126 fasts. How many days in the Gregorian year? 365. 365 days in the year, and you're fasting 126 days. That's a third of the year. That's a third of the year. In fact, it's more than a third of the year. So just by fasting in the month of Ramadan and fasting on a Monday and a Thursday, 
every week you are fasting a third of the year every single year what an achievement we make intention inshallah i make intention as well bi idhnillah with the permission of allah to fast every monday and thursday and maintain the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so alhamdulillah that was our library event for uh, march the spiritual dimensions of fasting i hope that you've benefited from that alhamdulillah and i ask you for your duas that you allow us to, uh, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to continue in the service of the deen we have on here um facebook instagram and youtube gs mosque or our website gsmosque.org if you'd like uh, further updates also this is being live streamed is it yeah, after two hours i'm asking if it's being live streamed it's being live streamed on our youtube which is gs mosque and that's where you'll find inshallah all of our library lectures are up on there the weekly hadith lecture quran lecture are also on there our monthly events are also on there inshallah and anything that we do deliver will be on there uh, lastly next saturday the 26th we have a fiqh of ramadan fiqh of fasting uh, course so next saturday the 26th of march 10 a.m to 1 p.m for three hours we're in the education center inshallah uh, for brothers and for sisters of all ages to attend and we'll cover the ahkam fiqhia the fiqh rulings revolving around the fast uh, what breaks the fast what doesn't break the fast some misconceptions as well and uh, an element of ruhaniyat will be mentioned there as well inshallah uh, so try level best to attend and pass on those words walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen uh, do you have any questions if you have any fiqh questions i'll just put this out there i'm not going to answer them because they all will be answered on saturday if allah wills inshallah so any fiqh questions inshallah on the saturday during the fiqh of fasting uh, any spiritual questions we have a whole section there tasawwuf ruhaniyat so that leaves you with nothing to ask <laughs> Gee, yes so um, it's a good question mashallah but um so the, the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the month of ramadan would uh, before the month of ramadan would end the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would uh, reduce other responsibilities the sahaba would reduce other responsibilities as well and as the last 10 days of ramadan would approach uh, the the hadith mentions the, uh, the literal translations that the prophet sallallahu alaihi would tie his garment which means which would be the equivalent in the english as roll up the sleeves and now is the time to focus so i would definitely say that a person who is working and has other responsibilities should try to uh, make um, uh, make time for the month of ramadan you don't have to take you know 30 days off from work but if you can have annual leave and um, put that annual leave within the last 10 days of ramadan so you can work, uh, focus on the ibadah i would definitely recommend that if people you know with the annual leave they try to accommodate holidays vacations and it'd be excellent if they can accommodate i know brothers alhamdulillah they do this with the annual leave to calculate when the last two weeks of ramadan are and put the annual leave there so that now they can focus on the blessed month of ramadan so i wouldn't say completely take off your time we're living in the dunya is not practical but wherever we have ability and capacity to make more time for ibadah in Ramadan, then definitely we should be making more time for ibadah in Ramadan. Inshallah. Mashallah, very good question. Is that all? Let's do dua. Um, our uh, Imam of uh, Sultan Bahu uh, Trust, Allama Abdul Ghafoor Ahmed Jishti, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali, had a sudden death two days ago. Inshallah, Fatiha for uh, Imam Saab. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا رب العالمين
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم أوصل ثواب ما قرأنا إلى حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وإلى سائر الأنبياء والمرسلين والصحابة والتابعين ومن تبعهم بحسان إلى يوم الدين والله سبحانه وتعالى we present this reward the ruh of your beloved صلى الله عليه وسلم to all the prophets عليهم الصلاة والسلام the noble companions the أهل البيت the صالحين the أولياء وعلماء accept this from us يا رب العالمين Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we especially do isal sawab <coughs> to the ruh of Sultan al-Awliya, Muhyiddin Sayyiduna Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, <coughs> to Sultan Hind, Khwaja Ajmer, Bahauddin Naqshaban, Shihabuddin Sahurward, Abu al-Hasna Shadili, Mujaddid al-Fasani, all the Khwajgan and the Awliya of the Salasil, <coughs> and to the ruh of Huzuz in the Apir, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alay, accept this from us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We present this to the ruh of our honorable Ali Medin, the teacher of hundreds if not thousands, Alama Ghafur Ahmad Jishti, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, O Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, elevate his status. O Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, forgive any of his shortcoming. <coughs> o Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, grant his family members sabr, patience and the ability to deal with this loss. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> allow us to prepare for the month of Ramadan. وَبَلِّغْنَا Ramadan, وَبَلِّغْنَا Ramadan, وَبَلِّغْنَا Ramadan. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us into righteous practicing Muslims. Ya Rabbil Alameen, if we have spiritual guides, shuyukh, murabbis, murshid, peers, we ask you to make us all into murid sadiq of our murshid. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you, that you allow us, that whatever work we do, whatever work you allow us to do, we do it for your sake and your sake only, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the elderly who are living with us, we ask you to give them long healthy lives. We ask you to protect the iman of our children and youth. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Rahmatika ya rahman rahim. Barakallahu